Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas, and we bring you the latest in everything cool every single day. And we've got an amazing show for you lined up. Uh, Josh Swee, who has got a, a great deal of information about the history of Midway Games, is going to join me right after the rundown. I've got a live review of the uh, Justice League 4K for you, which I watched this morning. Uh, we've got an awesome reviews on the run for you and a buried treasure, all kinds of really enjoyable stuff. But let's get started with your rundown. And today I'm dedicating it to uh, the late and very great Stephen Hawking, who uh, you want to talk about superheroes, this guy fought to educate the world and fought for science. Uh, he was a wonderful uh, icon out there in our world, and he will be greatly missed and never forgotten. Let's get started with Stephen Hawking's Rundown. Monster Hunter World is about to get a whole lot bigger. Capcom has announced that the first big expansion for the game will launch on March 22nd. It's known as the Devil Joe DLC, and as the title implies, will give players new quests where they can hunt the classic Monster Hunter adversary, Devil Joe. Although there have been several smaller updates, like new characters and gear, this will be the biggest yet, and is just the first of many big updates and in-game events that Capcom has on the way. Best of all, the Devil Joe update is free for all players. Uh, this is Capcom sort of, uh, you know, taking over the world with Monster Hunter World, and uh, this is amazing. And it's just getting bigger and bigger, and people are still playing it. I saw our buddy Greg Miller, uh, you know, he's been playing this for you know, weeks now, and he's uh, basically camping out on the weekends and, and uh, sharing screens with pals and, and uh, continuing on. This is an incredible game. I wish I had more time to play Monster Hunter World, but uh, congratulations to Capcom and everybody that's playing this game because you're getting a lot more cool stuff. Speaking of cool stuff, Sega is bringing some of the most iconic games, their most iconic games, to new systems but not all the new systems. The publisher has announced that the Sega Genesis Collection, featuring more than 50 retro Genesis games, including Sonic the Hedgehog, Echo the Dolphin, Golden Axe, Shining Force, and more, uh, and unfortunately, the collection hasn't been announced yet for the Nintendo Switch, but hopefully it will find its way there soon. That's the system I want to play it on. I'm sure you want to play it on. I know Blake wants to play it on the Nintendo Switch. It's great that it's coming to the PS4 and Xbox One as well, but it'd be great to be able to, you know, carry it around and play these games anywhere that you want to. The Sega Genesis Collection hits the PS4, Xbox One on uh, May 29th, and it's also going to be available on Steam. I think there's stuff already available on Steam, but they're going to, like, flip the Switch to make uh, everything that's available on PS4 and Xbox One um, at par on Steam as well. It's worth pointing out, though, that outside of North America, the Sega Genesis Collection uh, will be called the Sega Mega Drive Collection because that's what the original console was called everywhere else in the world. Um, I think the game, if I've got to pick one that I'm looking forward to playing the most it, out, out of this Sega Genesis Collection is Gunstar Heroes, incredible game from Treasure. I'm also really, really excited to play the Streets of Rage series again. I've been jonesing to play those games. Now, uh, over in the TV land, the maker of the cerebral new science fiction movie, Annihilation, which I hope you've all seen, is heading to television. Alex Garland, who wrote and directed Annihilation, along with the 2015 movie Ex Machina, which is also incredible, is working on a TV series with, with FX. It's called Devs, and like his previous work, will explore the darker aspects of science and technology, focusing on a young software developer who discovers that the company she works for is secretly up to no good. Garland's Annihilation received rave reviews, including from yours truly, but failed financially, so hopefully his new show will have better luck. FX hasn't given it a pilot order. Oh, F FX has given it a pilot order, but we'll have to wait and see if it gets picked up for a full series. This guy is incredible. He's, uh, you know, creating some of the most indelible science fiction out there. It's stuff that he creates, and it takes a little while because they're, you know, independent. They're a little bit smaller. They don't get the full studio support that some of these big blockbusters get. And so people find them, and they discover what a talent he is, and then they talk about it. So I feel like Annihilation will make more than its money back and will become one of these, uh, you know, cult classics that people point to. It's a tremendous movie, uh, and I think he's going to have a lot of success with FX, who isn't afraid to uh, experiment a little bit, and will give him all of the, you know, sort of the maturity uh, kind of freedom that, that he wants to, the mature freedom that he wants to. I'm sure it'll have lots of violence and uh, sexuality and explore all kinds of cool themes because that's 
you know, kind of a hallmark of his previous work. Looking forward to that. Uh, now, back in the video game land, Google and Ubisoft are joining forces to make online gaming a whole lot smoother. The two companies are working on an open source game server system called Agones. Uh, the idea is that game, uh, that any game developer will be able to use the service to easily create their own dedicated servers to run online games like shooters, MMOs, and MOBAs, rather than building those dedicated servers from the ground up which can be very costly and time consuming. Uh, having dedicated servers can make or break an online game success, absolutely. So hopefully this will make things a lot better for games and for gamers. Keep your eyes on Google. They are um, encroaching on the game space and they are taking things very, very seriously. And this is probably the start of many announcements. I, I wouldn't uh, be surprised if we see something cool at E3. Speaking of which, I just uh, found out today that Microsoft has taken over the LA Live space for their announcement at E3 this year, their, their sort of press announcement thing, uh, which says to me, that's a, that's a very visible space in downtown LA right next to uh, uh, the convention center. And that says to me, that they've got a lot of ammunition and they're going to come out with some uh, really big news so i'm excited about that now it looks like game maker bethesda softworks has put aside their bad blood with vr company oculus bethesda has announced that the virtual reality version of skyrim first released on the playstation vr last year will finally hit the pc on april 3rd it will be available on the htc vive windows mixed reality headsets and also the oculus rift making it the first bethesda vr game available on that headset Bethesda famously sued Oculus for intellectual property theft, claiming that they stole their software, and Bethesda won more than a half a billion dollars when the lawsuit ended last year. With Skyrim hitting the Oculus Rift, it seems as though both parties are willing to move on. Bethesda plans to create more VR titles going forward. This is huge. Uh, you know, Skyrim on PlayStation VR is uh, one of the best examples of why you would want VR in the first place. It's an enormous property uh, with tremendous freedom, giving you, you know, access to a, you know, a rich world, and it's so compelling to play. It's really hard to not play that game. Whether you play it on the Switch, any of the other consoles, and when you get lost in VR, it's like, oh my god, it's incredible. The only thing holding it back on the PlayStation VR is, of course, it didn't have all of the, uh, the resolution technology that's in both the Vive and the Rift. Uh, so I am absolutely going to check it out again, uh, and I'll give you my thoughts when it hits on, on uh, April 3rd, if not before, but I'm excited as hell. This is big news. It's great to see that the VR support, I mean, you know, clearly a lot of the sort of launch hype has, has faded a little bit, and now it's like, okay, show me what you got, you know? I was stoked about Moss, and I think I mentioned it, but... If I didn't, when I played Moss and reviewed it, you guys know I had the developers on here. If you haven't checked out my interview with those guys, you should. But uh, when I played that game, that was a big launch uh, title for the PlayStation VR. And what it made me do after I beat it was explore some of the other VR titles that I haven't gone back to in a little while. And I played uh, 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 the, the Eve Valkyrie uh, spaceship flying game again, and it's incredible. They've updated that like crazy. and. I, I appreciated it again, you know, I played a little Gran Turismo in VR uh, and, and it was it was really compelling, you know, very, very solid. So it's titles like this and announcements like this that will keep people engaged and coming back to VR. We need huge titles like Skyrim. Clearly, we're not going to be, uh, uh, you know, going into brand new titles at that scale in VR anytime soon with that much content being built because it just would be so prohibitively expensive for the install base just not being there. But it's a great move for VR. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, that's our rundown for today. Now it's time to take a look at this day and everything cool. Welcome to This Day and Everything Cool for March 14th. On this day in 1942, humanity began winning our timeless battle with single-celled bacteria. That was the day that a dying patient's life was successfully saved by penicillin. Discovered a few decades earlier, penicillin is an antibiotic that kills bacteria, which makes it invaluable for fighting bacteria-based infections like pneumonia and preventing hospital-acquired infections in patients being treated for other problems. Penicillin changed medicine throughout the remainder of the 20th century, turning once deadly 
deadly diseases into easily curable annoyances, but it hasn't been without problems. The overuse of antibiotics, particularly in over-the-counter consumer products, has made bacteria stronger and stronger, which could mean that antibiotics will be useless at some point down the road. March 14, 1995 was an important day for humans cooperating in space. American astronaut Norman Thagard rode to the Russian Mir space station aboard the Russian Soyuz spacecraft, becoming the first American to ride to space on board a Russian vehicle. This had been unthinkable just a few years earlier, before the fall of the Soviet Union, and this was just the first in a long line of joint space missions between the former Cold War adversaries. Hopefully, humanity will be able to set aside more of our differences before we venture even further out into space. Man, we love talking about sp space exploration here on EP. We have got a terrific guest on the show today, and I'm very happy and glad that he's joining us. Josh Sway is uh, a, d a game developer. He worked at Midway uh, during the 90s, worked on games like Fight Night and Tony Hawk, and had a very nice career making games for a long time. And he's not done yet, but what he's done recently is uh, kind of shift his focus to build a documentary that I firmly believe in. It's all about the history of Midway. We're going to show you a little bit of the doc, and we're going to talk about the history of Midway and uh, what Josh has been up to. But ladies and gentlemen, Josh Sway is with us. How are you, my friend? Good. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for joining us, Josh. And I think what we should do um, is give people a little taste of what your work has been the last little while. And we've got a clip. Do you mind setting it up for us? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So what you're going to see here is... Um, there was a game that Williams made in the very late 80s called NARC. And uh, in many ways, this was the return of the arcade. And a lot of people know that the arcades kind of had a downfall in the uh, early, you know, early to mid 80s. Yeah. And so Williams wanted to make this game called NARC that kind of brought them back. And this clip that uh, you're going to see here is basically the developers trying to figure out um, how violent this game should be. And it basically sets the tone for the entire 90s output from Midway Games at that time. Awesome. Let's take a look. I did have a question. At that point, we had filmed a few characters. We had filmed the environments. And I asked, uh, OK, we're a rocket launcher is one of your weapons now. And I said, OK, when a player fires the rocket launcher, what happens? And people said, what do you mean? I go, well. I can make it look real. These are real people. The mission was to, no, make, make it look real. Body parts would fly. I mean, I guess this was one of the first, you know, body part games. <laughs> I think maybe the first. I remember, like, George was like, God, this is so cool. I can't believe this is so cool. And, and I came up, and I was really being very gentle about it. And I just said, I mean, it is cool, but do, do, you think, do you think that's a good thing to put in an arcade where little kids are there? <laughs> that's one of my gaming heroes in that clip there. That's Eugene Jarvis, who made my favorite arcade game of all time, Robotron 2084. But Josh, uh, this, tell us who some of those other people were, some of those other faces in that clip. Yeah, uh, besides uh, Eugene Jarvis, there was uh, Jack Hager, who at the time was the art director at Williams, which eventually became Midway later on. Yeah, and a lot. You know, he he was known uh, previously for creating, um, being one of the creators of Sinistar, which is one of my favorite Williams. Oh, games. I love that game. And then the other person was Warren Davis, who was the creator of Cubert, who was also a programmer at Williams. Oh my so, God! Crazy. So like, yeah. it just it just shows you that this company, even early on, had just gods working there. Yeah. I mean, it was really amazing to be to be amongst these people. And, and that's why I always thought that it would be um, a great documentary to make. When did you start at Midway and what was your first game that you uh, worked on over there? Yeah, uh, my first game, well, I started, I always forget if it's, it's 92 or 93, it was like somewhere in there. I think it was like early 93. Yeah. And uh, the very first game I worked on was with the NBA Jam team, which was WrestleMania, the arcade game. Oh, great. So they had just, that team had just come off of the first NBA Jam, hugely successful game. And, uh, and one of the uh, designers was a big wrestling fan. And at that point, uh, Mortal Kombat had already come out. So they thought, well, let's do a wrestling game with the same style as Mortal Kombat. And, uh, and I ended up getting hired as a just all around general artist on the project. That's cool. How did the WrestleMania game do? Was it a success for Midway? 
It, you know, it, it, as an arcade game, it was a moderate success. You know, it wasn't nearly as big as NBA Jam or, or Mortal Kombat at the time. Yeah. Um, but it found a really good success on the home market. Um, Acclaim did a great job of marketing it. Uh, it I think for, it was one of the launch titles for the PlayStation 1, so it did extremely well there. And it's funny, you know, uh, over 20 years later, people still bring that game up. You know? and, and this is, I think it's aged better now. Like, I, I played it recently. It's like, yeah, I think I, I have more fun playing it now because it's it, there's some distance from the Mortal Kombat games now from it. Because before, it came out right after Mortal right. Kombat. Right, yes. And it was, just, it was just too much of a comparison. Yeah, you're mentioning some of these massive icons, even the idea of Acclaim being gone as well, you know? Like... It's just so surreal like, that these massive behemoth industries or, you know, chunks of the industry can just disappear like that. Why, how? How did Midway sort of self-destruct? What happened with this company? You know, I mean, there's, you know, there's no real one thing, but, you know, one of the things that kind of shifted a lot of, um, a lot of the energy away was, you know, towards the late 90s, you know, the consoles just became really powerful. Mm. You know, back in the day, the arcade machines were always at the top of the food chain. And they had the most power. You know, the hardware was made specifically for that one game. So, I mean, they were just doing crazy things. Yeah. Um, and then the PlayStation 1 comes out, and, and it was pretty good. You know, there was a lot of 3D power on there. But it really wasn't until the PlayStation 2 came around. And all of a sudden, it was, you know, people were like, wait a second, this thing is as good as what I'm seeing in the arcade. Yeah. And have to drop in a quarter every 20 seconds so it started sh shifting things around and uh when just when you got that power at home why would you want to leave home yeah totally and it's not like midway didn't have a great long run either right like we talk about midway and i think your doc kind of focuses on the 90s but midway was there as williams as the pinball machine company for decades and then it also had a great run as a video game brand yeah in the 80s before, you know, NBA Jam and Mortal Kombat and all that stuff, right? Yeah, that's the thing is that, you know, Williams had this incredible run in the early 80s with Eugene Jarvis doing yeah. games like, like Defender sold 55,000 machines. Now think about that, 55,000 machines and each machine was around like three to $4,000. Yeah. So that's a massive hit. Yes. You know, none of the arcades died, came back in the 90s, but then when the arcades died again in the 90s, Midway had a you know had a pretty good run in the home market yep. for a while up until yeah you know, I think they closed in or they went bankrupt in two thousand and eight yeah so that company has had a lot of different chapters and for, just for myself the nineties for me was an easy thing because I was there at the time so it was something that I can really sink my teeth into but there 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 are a lot of stories before and after and so uh, let's talk about that and I want to talk about because uh, obviously you've made a lot of friendships and you've got this incredible access and I for one just am so excited that these stories are being told because I feel like we live in this society of uh, especially with games uh, where there's a disposability and we just move on and we never think about who makes them or the the craft that goes into this stuff but take me and us into uh, walking through the halls and working at Midway in the 90s what was it like? Wow, that is, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of nuts. It's not, it's not anything like you would experience now. You know, the video game department at Williams Valley Midway was literally a space that was in the back of a pinball factory. Okay. So when you say walking through the hallways, you're not walking through the hallway, you're walking through a giant assembly uh, line of pinballs being made. <laughs> and so you're seeing hundreds and hundreds of people making these machines. You go all the way in the back, and now you have this cubicle land of uh, you know with, with what looks like a tent city of homeless people and that's the video game department you know so, so that's what always blew my mind even back then you know i thought to myself you know wow you know there are these video game developer gods working on these games and nba jam just hit mortal kombat had just hit and stuff and then you see this this you know it looked like a bomb shelter that you're working but you know that's always been one of our jokes uh, you know uh during that period was our, our conditions were so miserable that that's, <laughs> that's why the games came out so good. Like, uh, you know, Midway games during that era, were, they were like gritty and aggressive. And, you know, we, you know, like just we didn't care about the rules and stuff. But, you know, in the documentary, uh, Ernest Klein, who wrote Ready Player One, yeah. he stood up best. He said Midway games in the 90s um, was like the punk rock of video games. Yeah. And, and that's 
how it was. It was just like, just do it and ask for forgiveness later. Well, you guys were kind of like the uh, Detroit Pistons, I think, in the 80s as well, right? You're just like rough and tumble. You're so correct. But I think in that, uh, uh, you know, trying to kind of make your own way, you guys innovated and you just came up with different, you broke so many rules, like putting full motion video into a... uh, into a video game that you would see at the arcade. I, I mean, I remember seeing Mortal Kombat and going, I, what, how is this, how can they do this? How am I controlling this video guy? You know, it was, it was surreal. And I guess you had to learn new yeah. things like, like crazy there, right? Yeah, I mean, there, you know, it, like techniques are being made up on the spot, yeah. you know? So like we talk, you know, in the clip you saw NARC, NARC really be, uh, catapulted everything forward the hardware made for NARC, the digitizing process for NARC and everything like that, that's, you know, Mortal Kombat came out of that. NBA Jam came out of that. Mm. And But with each game, the hardware would change a little bit, the techniques would change, and, you know, the rules were always being adjusted for new things. Um, and, you know, in the case of Mortal Kombat, you know, you have, you know, you have things that are, there were game other games that did digitization, but, you know, nobody put as much care into making the digitized images look really good as as much as the midway artist is so there's a lot of you know this uh it sounds stereotypical but it's almost like this midwestern work you know work ethic of just crafting something until yeah. it's just as polished as possible and and that's the way the mentality was i visited midway i think in uh 2000 could have been 2000 or 2001 um and it was like Mortal Kombat 4 time frame. And, and uh, by that point, the, you guys had fully adopted the, the sort of console development skew. And it was a bigger, uh, it wasn't the tent city thing like you're describing right there. There was more of a move towards actually having a, you know, a full-fledged video game studio. But what struck me, I mean, I met Termel there, Mark Termel, who was the head on uh, NBA Jam. And I met Eugene uh, Jarvis, and I've interviewed him many times. But I, 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 there were... There was a lot of really big success there, but there was, um, you, you know, we're, an attitude that I saw, and it might have been just for the cameras and just for the press, but it felt like we were all in it together. I didn't really get a sense of, like, the star system at Midway, you know? Was it a pretty, you know, flat hierarchy? Did you guys all feel like you could chip in and, and contribute in tons of different ways? Yeah, it, it was it was very flat. I mean, it was almost ridiculously flat, you know. Yeah. And the teams were small, so everybody did a little bit of everything. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, the, you know, these guys like Tremel and Boone and and, and everyone else, they, they were hugely successful. But yeah, if you saw them in the hallway, you would have no idea. Yeah. You know, because people, when you're at the at the studio at the office, it's all about the work. You know, nobody had nobody has errors or anything like that. You know, there was great rivalry between the teams, though. Yeah. You know? And that's one of the more interesting things is that it was like this weird dichotomy of everybody was super friendly to each other, but they really competed against each other. And that really made some great games. And, uh, you know, but again, you know, going back to that flat hierarchy later on, when you get to midway doing more and more home games and teams start getting bigger and games start getting bigger, that flat hierarchy started to kind of betray itself a little bit yes. and get made it a little bit more difficult. Yeah, because suddenly you were competing against other studios that had a you know more regimented system, and the games became you know much much more expensive and more detailed. Uh, you you mentioned Ed Boone, and he's a guy that I've known for uh, you know almost twenty five years. I, I interviewed him for uh, you know the first time I went to E three in ninety five, and he's always been the same genuine down-to-earth guy and the thing that I, I i love about him is that every time he comes out with a successful game which is every time he comes out with a game uh <laughs> he thanks everybody on the team in different ways and messages and and uh you know con panels and stuff like that but he names them and he shows people's work um I, he, he's one of the greats man like he like like one of the great people that i've i've known in the games industry for the years over the years was that kind of the attitude by the uh, the lifers at Midway, the people that are, you know, still making games and have kind of moved on and learned all of their, their lessons from Midway? Yeah, every, I mean, everyone's still, you know, despite all the success and everything, um, everybody is, you know, they they still have the same attitude as they had before, which is, hey, we make, we make games, you know, we're just lucky that we're making games and making a living out of it and having fun with it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was just recently out in San Diego uh, visiting Mark Trammell, you know, and, you know, Mark's been successful well before Midway. I mean, he was, a, he, you know, he was making 
uh, great games when he was 18 years old and stuff. And yeah, I visit his, his beautiful house in San Diego and stuff, and he's you know amazingly successful. But you know, we're out getting a cheap burger somewhere. Yeah. You know, telling me, hey, you know what? Don't tell my wife I had a burger because I'm supposed to be eating a salad. Yeah. You know, like that. So, yeah. so it's just one just very just normal. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things that's kept me doing what I do, you know, for 25 years now. Is that that that, that accessibility and. Uh, that willingness to talk and and I think the the importance I think that people recognize in in uh, uh, sharing some of these stories and like that must have been something that struck you as well like you have shifted your whole sort of focus your career focus in this direction that's not easy to do in any career but it must have been an overwhelming sensation for you you must have realized look these are these stories are going to pass us by if we don't stop and talk about them right yeah, that's exactly what happened. I mean, it's, you know, even when I was working there, I felt kind of the weight of history while I was there because mm. just things were just happening a lot. And so, you know, over the years, I, I've always kind of kept that in me. I always thought, you know what, there's, it's, you know, there's such a great group of characters, you know, and the great situations that would come up. And so it was around, so I had this idea to do this film for a really long time. And then around 2015, I started to realize that, you know what, if I don't do this, somebody else is going to do it. Yeah. And, and, and somebody else is probably going to really mess it up, yeah. you know, just not at the right point. So that kind of kicked me in the butt to just kind of let's just get the process going. So I had, you know, so I basically was working on it part time while I was doing other things for, you know, over like over a year and a half. And then about, you know, almost a year ago, I, I, I started realizing that, hey, I have something really great here. I had done all the interviews already. I was starting to see the story form. And I just felt like, you know what, to do this justice, um, you know, I, I need to spend a lot of time on it. So I, I, so I just decided I'm just going to work on this full time and just really, you know, blast it through, get it crafted, get a great story together and just and just get it done. Um, so that's been my life for like almost a year now. That's because awesome. I just felt, it just got to a point where I felt like, hey, it deserves the time at this point that I did to, to, you know, to get it done. One hundred percent, Josh. Are you? Um, is it mostly you as the full time crew on this? Do you go out and shoot everything and sit behind the camera? And are you lighting? Yeah, it, yeah. Yeah. For the most part, it's been myself. Um, yeah, I've had help on some of the shoots where you know, if it's if it's easy for me to get a, like a mini crew together, I'll you know, I'll, I'll get that together. Yeah. Um, I've been getting some editing help, motion graphics and such. I've been doing most of the editing myself up to this point, but it, it'll get to a point where then I pass it off to a real editor to yeah. then go in and polish things up, maybe move things around that he or she feels you know is needed. And, uh, and Dude, go from you're there. an inspiration. And, and <laughs> honestly, there's going to be a lot of people watching this right now that are kind of trying to figure out where they're going with their life. And here's a guy that's been making games for 20 years and says, no, I want to I want to be a filmmaker. And you're you're t learn you're teaching yourself as you go. And the technology is so available, right? Like you can get it. Yeah, that's a crazy thing. Like, you know, even as recent as five years ago, I don't think this would have been possible. Right. But when I really like I said, a couple of years ago, and I really looked at the landscape, it's like, all right, here's how much this equipment costs. Here are my resources. And when I really looked at that. I realized, man, this isn't like when I was going to film school in college where it, it was just everything was way too hard to do. Yeah. So, you know, I got some pointers. I asked for advice. You know, I've been talking with other documentarians and just kind of learning as I go, YouTube has an amazing, you know, amount of resources for first time filmmakers. And I just I just studied up as I went along. And even as I'm editing when I run into a problem, I'll look something up real quick and find the answers instantly. So it's an amazing time to create stuff like this. Yeah, and I think what you're doing too also speaks to the importance of recognizing that uh, that kernel of an idea and jumping on it, you know, don't letting it pass by, right? Like this is something that absolutely will get told. You're 100% right. And and honestly, you'll come out with insert coin and then someone's probably going to get inspired and say, well, let me, let me go back and do more on this or whatever, you know. Uh, but I think that what you're doing is such an important part of uh, uh, sort of the creative world right now is you just have to go. You have to make it. You got to just do it. There's yep. really nothing holding us back anymore, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, you know, one of my favorite um, YouTubers and, and I've and I, I was on a panel with them a few years ago. It was uh, Casey Neistat, yeah. and he just his whole thing is just just do things you know that you want to do. I think the slogan is you know do the things that you can do, and uh, and I think that's exactly it. Just 
there's nowadays there's just no excuse not to try something out make the mistakes you know and then do it again just keep iterating on things well i'm going to ask you um i think two two very tough questions not too tough not personal okay uh but uh, uh you know why should people care about midway like what are the seminal creations from midway and why don't people care about midway Huh, interesting. So, I mean, I think the thing that why they should care about Midway is that, you know, this was um, a slight, you know, a slice of time where games were being made that affected entertainment that came out later on, you know, like, like, you know, Mortal Kombat obviously is a huge property, but the way Mortal Kombat came out and the way the movie, you know, they, you know, they spawned a huge movie, you know, and it just, you know, led this whole revolution in terms of that style of, uh, of video games. NBA Jam, you know, in my opinion, out of all the games, NBA Jam was probably the biggest um, uh, mainstream hit out there. I mean, you, you have people who don't even like playing video games still playing NBA Jam yeah. at arcades and stuff. It's a 25 you know, year anniversary of NBA Jam right now too. Exactly, yeah. you know, you got that. And you know, even like sports graphics for the NFL got changed because of NFL Blitz. You know, so there are these little things that people think, hey, they're just video games, but really there were such huge hits that the people who played them later on went on to work for, let's say, the NFL and things like that. Right. And you know, it, it, they, they changed the culture of things. And then, and, you, know, why, you know, why do some people don't care for it? Um, I think, you know, <laughs> Midway Games was so over the top on things, you know. I mean, you know, when, when, you're, when your company is, uh, is being talked about on Congress every night for a month, you know, <laughs> pigeonhole and say hey it's just video games they're a bunch of idiots making violent video games right. and they don't care for it but you know one of the things that i touch on in the documentary is that you know it wasn't like everybody at the studio was all gung-ho on doing violent stuff I and mean, yeah. there were some people that were very concerned but you look at the clip that was just shown there was concern about that and and you know as silly as it may sound now because it's all these low-res graphics being violent back then it was a big deal and you know some people were like oh who cares people love it and there were other people that were like yeah you know what you know, I have kids. I, I'm gonna have a hard time explaining this to them. You know that I that I worked on this. So it goes it goes around both sides. Do you think that it was uh, such a successful, you know, especially the '90s? They were so successful that uh, and and crossed over into popular culture in such a big way that it it, it kind of got dated. You know, like we it, it had its moment and then pop culture moved. Like when you get to that sort of echelon. It's like you don't really worry about the way the rest of the industry is. You just worry about sort of being at that level. And then if, if tastes change, because they do, and you can't maintain that level, like maybe spending was so high or whatever, that it, like the moment passed and Midway just couldn't keep up with the moment kind of thing. Yeah, kind of. I mean, it, you know, there's, there's, a, that, there's always that risk of, um, you know, it's like, you know, hey, things have moved on. Should we keep trying to catch up? How do we keep upping the ante? Yeah. And sometimes it could end up looking like you're trying too hard. Yeah. So there were definitely, you know, moments of some of the games like that. You know, like the, the over top, over the top sports games, you know, after a while, it was just like, well, you're going to hit a ceiling eventually. Yeah. And I can keep it. You can't always keep this, being... this is coming from a guy who made a Tony Hawk game. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. Some t some tough lessons get learned, right? Like, oh yeah. And that's the thing, right? It, it is you're chasing this moving target of what are people going to want to play, you know? And you're trying to you're trying to figure that out two years before they can play it, and it's yeah. it, it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah. I mean, and you know, as games got bigger and bigger, like in the arcade was one thing, you know, in arcade like the games would take less than a year to make, you would test it out in arcade and get feedback right away. Yeah. Nowadays, you know, some, you know, the bigger games, they take, you know, at least a couple of years to make. Yeah, you're doing testing and things like that, but you really don't know. <laughs> it's almost like baking a cake for two years. You don't know what it's going to be like at the end. Yeah. And who knows, the taste of you know, the culture might have changed by the time you're done. So you have no idea. It, it just gets so much tougher. That's awesome. Do you have... Um... I mean, obviously, you're close to a lot of the, the titles that came out in the 90s, but I'm wondering if you've got a favorite, you know, collection of Midway titles that people should play. Oh, man. You know, um, I mean, there's the obvious one. Like, you know, out of the Mortal Kombat series, Mortal Kombat 2 is my favorite one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, out of the sports series, uh, the NBA Showtime, uh, yeah, Showtime for me uh, was my favorite basketball game. And Is that the one Vinyaki worked on? 
Oh no, I think that was after that was, oh, it was Ballers. Was the ball, Ballers series. Yes, right, yeah. It's so funny you bring him up. Yeah. I'm actually going to see him at GC. <laughs> He's <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Showtime was great because, I mean, I, you know, like, uh, the last time, we used to play Showtime a lot, and that was the one game that I would almost get um, violent about. Like, I would get so, <laughs> so pissed off. And, like, we would end up, in, like, almost in fist fights at the studio playing that game. So yeah. I love that game. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, I think those two are, the, are are definitely the best for me. I, uh, you know, like what drove me to create Electric Playground, I've been playing games for, you know, most of my life. And the 80s were very important to me. I still talk about Robotron all the time and uh, Defender and Sinistar and that stuff. It blows my mind that, you know, the guy that made Qbert. That's just this. That's crazy. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> uh, was there a recognition of, of, you know, the value of those creations and those people at Midway? Was there always sort of respect paid to people like Eugene Jarvis at the company? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, you know, like when I when I first walked in there, um, you know, I was a huge 80s gamer also. So I, I you know, I knew these people, yeah. but I didn't, even, I didn't know that they were still at Williams. And uh, so the, I remember my first day working, uh, you know, coming into Midway, and meeting Jarvis, and I, my my head just flipped. Yeah, you know, I, I went into fanboy mode. Yeah, you know, John Newcomer, who created Jaws, was still there. Oh God, you know, Davis, you know, well, Kubert, obviously. So, but especially for Eugene Jarvis, I mean, he, you know, really set the tone for the studio. He 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 was basically running the game studio okay. when he came back to Dunark, and so he set the tone for everything. It, it's uh, and when you talk to any of the guys, you know, like Boone, Tremel, and you know. Um, any of the designers there, they will all always defer to Eugene. They will always say that he's the godfather of video games, and uh, there's an amazing amount of respect for him and for the other people also. There is something really unique about Eugene, you know, because I, I remember I had an interview with him when I visited Midway, but and I'm sure that he had that that clout and that kind of role when I was there, but it wasn't sort of externalized you know it wasn't something that was immediately available he was just in his office and he was just low-key about it and he, engaging and funny and and passionate but uh there was not this kind of and maybe that's one of the things that kind of helped set the tone is that uh you know he yeah. recognized the value in in uh we're all in this together yeah no it's he definitely set the tone of that like he there was no errors about him he he was as goofy as anybody else, he was as much of a clown as anybody else. Cool. And I think you know, when when so, when you see that the top guy acts that way, then everybody relaxes. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's one of those things that you know, one of the things I learned when making a documentary is um, uh, Ken Fidesna, who was heading up the development the, the the studio at Midway in the nineties. Um, yeah, he told me that like you know you got to remember you know Eugene Jarvis is a genius. The guy yeah. is you know he's super smart and things like that and he will intentionally act a certain way to keep people at ease. Right. On things, you know, but behind the scenes, man, he's like his brain is always churning. And you hear stories from other programmers where they ask him to solve a problem and he acts like he doesn't know, it, you know, and just kind of acts goofy and stuff like that. Then he spits out the answer like instantly. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is amazing. And for those who don't know, like, uh, you know, Robotron and Defender. Robotron is like the first dual stick shooter game. Smash TV, uh, he also developed and uh, uh, Defender was was seminal. And uh, Eugene stayed in arcade. He also did the Cruisin' series and worked with Nintendo and all of that stuff. But uh, he has stayed, he runs a company called Raw Thrills. Is he still making yep. arcade games to this day? They, they are like, I think they're the, they're, they're the biggest American arcade company. If you go to like a, a Dave and Buster's or, you know, or any of these family fun centers, um, you know, if video game wise, not the redemption games, but the video games, uh, I bet you like 75% of the machines are from his company. That's great. It's, it's hugely successful. That is awesome. Um, w when you were making this documentary and you're showing it off, I think in public for the first time next week, right at the game developers conference. Yeah. Am I right about that? Congrats. Uh, was there a mo <laughs> was there a moment when you were shooting, uh, or maybe in post when you're putting it all together where you went, oh, my God, this is why I'm doing this. Was there one of those or were there can you can you sort of take us into that moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, in, in all honesty, like uh, I had so many of those moments come up um, and it wasn't, you know, any one part of the story or anything like that. What will come up is like I, it, 
it was almost like this uh, Rashomon thing where one person tells a story and then I hear it from another point of view oh, cool. and they contradict each other. And like moments like that, I love it because it's kind of like, you know, it, everything is so subjective. Yes. You know, so, you know, it, so things like that was really exciting. Um, but, you know, I, I think the biggest rushes I would get is when I find a piece of archival material that jives with something somebody said. Yeah. And I it, 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 like it's almost like, uh, you know, it's like being Indiana Jones of video games or you find this piece of video that nobody's ever seen before. Yeah. And it's in pristine condition and it illustrates something that somebody talked about. And so stuff like I mean, it, like, I, you know, if I had if I could do it, I would just work on this forever and make a giant 12 hour thing. Yeah. So because I have so much material to go through. Yeah. And I think that's been one of the more, most painful things about the project is you know, maybe 15% of it is going to be seen, yeah. you know, because ultimately it has to be, you know, an entertaining two hour film. Yeah. And, but there's just so much to go over because it's just, you know, there's just so many great stories, you know, to, you know, to tell. Well, Josh, I think this is going to be the beginning of something wonderful. And, and uh, I applaud your work ever since you announced this, you know, you and I have followed each other on Twitter and I've seen all your tweets and uh, I know how passionate you are. Uh, about this industry and about this beautiful company that uh, yeah, I hope people dive in and learn more. It breaks my heart that they're, you know, I just announced the uh, the Sega Genesis collection today yeah. uh, that's coming out pretty soon. And, and uh, we talk about all of this this flashback kind of content all the time. But here is this this bevy of material that is sort of splintered across a lot of rights holders right now. The EA owns some and Warner Brothers owns some. And we just don't like new Robotrons would be amazing, or new collections of Midway games would be amazing, a, a new variation on Joust. I, I think maybe Ready Player One, because there was a lot of uh, Midway th you know, threaded through the story, and hopefully uh, in the I haven't seen the movie yet, but maybe that will start to get people excited. I did dig the, uh, the Lego Midway arcade games thing that they did with with Lego Dimensions. Did you check that out? Did you did you ever yeah, get? I saw that. That was amazing. Yes. Yeah. So and somebody, you know, somebody coordinated the rights to it. So you, there there is hope. Yeah, I really hope so. Well, I, you know, your work and um, you know work about communicating about this, and also everybody that's watching this and and uh, you know has dug a Midway game in the past. Uh, they did get some cheesy ones in there. I remember they tried to bring back Narc, and it was it was kind of like this weird, over the top Miami Vice, -y, but super violent, and like nobody really dug that one. But <laughs> there, there's there there is so much to dig into, and I can't wait to see this thing finished. Good luck at GDC showing this off to people. I can't wait to read some of the uh, the uh, tweets and the people talking about it, uh, and I can't wait to see this when this is all done, my friend. Thank you so much, Victor. Yeah, and uh, definitely, you know, and you know, if anybody's interested uh, on um, getting on the mailing list to get up to date on things, because more and more material is starting to come out, yep. uh, go to uh, insertcoindoc.com, and uh, and you'll you'll start getting a lot more info uh, in the coming months. Awesome. This is uh, Josh Sway, filmmaker, making us an awesome documentary about Midway. But right now, we got to take a look at uh, my review of Kirby Star Allies. You should have seen the smile on my little girl's face when she saw Kirby Star Allies blasting away on my big screen television. This is a cacophony of color. There is so much, uh, you know, happiness emanating from the screen as you are playing this game. It's ridiculous. The music is bouncy and catchy. The characters, you know, starring Kirby, the most malleable, pudgy little pink ball of uh, fun that you've ever seen. Uh, he can be anything, this character, which is just pure genius from HAL Labs and Nintendo, uh, and we've seen Kirby in a million iterations in the past. This game is uh, unique in that you can play four players at a time, and you can also um, kind of control characters. You throw a little star at them, and then they become your AI-controlled buddy, or if you've got, you know, people to share Joy-Con with, you can play with other people, which is really the heart of the matter here. This is the way that you will want to enjoy Star Allies. This is one, uh, especially if you've got younger folks in your 
your family uh, or in your house for whatever reason. You got a visiting nephew or whatever, or you have somebody that's a kid at heart like me visiting your place. I'd be happy if you pass me a Joy-Con to play this game. Uh, it's very accessible and it's also very familiar. It's a you know side-scrolling platform game. Sometimes you go up and sometimes uh, you're in water and things like that. But for the most part, we've played many games like this. And in fact, we've played many Kirby games like this. But it is pretty trippy to uh, have all of these different AI buddies helping you out or human buddies. And then you can also um, call them in and uh, combine powers and effects and do some really crazy things like combine electricity with, uh, you know, a blade weapon or a staff weapon or fire with a spider web or something like that. Lots of cute sort of variations in there. And there are also uh, points where you can get the whole gang together and you jump on a train for a while and you blast through things or you do a little bit of a side-scrolling, uh, you know, shoot 'em up kind of deal where you're on a star blasting away at things. I always love those diversions. Very, very fun. And I like the oversized sort of uh, art style of the characters. They look massive on a big screen. TV and it's fun to see these these platforming characters look so big and uh, so pudgy and so cute. It does get a little mindless, like the game is almost kind of playing itself, but it doesn't sort of take away from the enjoyment of it or the uh, the great fidelity of it. It's a it's a well-made title uh, with lots of flashy effects and lots of cool hooks to keep you entertained. And there are also mini games in there, so there's actually quite a bit of meat on the bones with this Kirby game. Unfortunately for me, though, we've played better Kirby games. This is a, a proliferate character that's been everywhere in the past, and there's just been better games and even the Wii U uh, Kirby and the Rainbow Curse was the most recent one that I could point to uh, but there's been lots of really good titles out there and, and at this point Kirby is kind of his own worst enemy because there are so many other great Kirby titles that you can point to I loved Epic Yarn uh, I loved uh, you know Dreamland I talked about uh, uh, Kirby's Pinball Land in uh, which are di different experiences to be sure you know Mass Attack uh, there's just lots of great Kirby games out there this one is good it's solid. It's a solid game to take away on your Switch. I think that if you are a Kirby fan, you definitely need to add this to your collection. If you've got a Switch and you've got some younger folks that you play Switch games with, you are also going to love this title. I'm gonna give Kirby Star Allies an eight out of 10. You're gonna to wanna to play that one with a kid for sure. Uh, my daughter's eyes did light up when we were playing Kirby Star Allies. Good job, Nintendo. You are uh, making lots and lots of games for your new machine, which we like to see. Uh, but this morning, I uh, took a look at uh, Justice League, the 4K Blu-ray, and I thought maybe I'll shoot this as a regular reviews on the run. I said, you know what? This just came out. I just got it yesterday. It arrived from uh, Amazon. Shout out to Amazon. How you doing, Amazon? Uh, and uh, I, th I thought, why don't I watch this right now and I'll do a live review because I'm sure people are curious about my, uh, my thoughts. This was the second time that I got to see this movie, and uh, it... Uh, kind of blew me away. I got to tell you, I was uh, prepared to um, be m more disappointed than I was the first time that I saw it. And I saw it in the theater and reviewed it with Johnny for Film Fury. I gave it a seven out of 10. I thought that it was a, you know, kind of a clumsy, cluttered mess of a movie and you could feel the weight, you could feel like sort of the business proposition to get this thing done. And that still exists here. But um, in the confines of my, uh, my game cave, my back cave, uh, and sort of, uh, you know, popping off of the OLED TV that I have and running off the Xbox One X. It looked insane, first of all. This is one of the best looking 4K Blu-ray discs that I have right now. It's one of those showcase discs that you're gonna show off. There's a, tr a tremendous amount of green screen work in here uh, and lots and lots of effects and stuff, but the composition and the beauty of the image and the uh, the lighting that's hitting the costumes, and uh, it, it's stellar. It absolutely looks incredible and the audio fidelity is amazing. So, you know, uh, production-wise and uh, uh, aesthetics-wise, it's a treat. It really was a treat, but what I didn't really see the first time when I watched Justice League is that there also is a, a tremendous amount of heart sort of working its way through this movie and a lot of effort to kind of convey that heart. And the thing that, that struck me as I watched it is it was put together wrong. It was put together in sort of the reverse order as we've often talked about uh, collectively and I'm sure with your friends and stuff out there. Um, about the way that DC has approached just, you know, throwing a few movies out there and then slamming a team together and trying to reverse engineer our education on some of these uh, characters and making us care about them. 
And you can see that, but you can also feel the weight of Joss Whedon sort of being swooped in to try to, you know, make this a little bit more of a friendly escape than maybe Zack Snyder had originally intended this to. Maybe this was going to be a bit darker. We don't know. I don't know if we will ever know. But what I kind of recognized when I watched it again is that that could have been the real story, is that partnership between the Snyders, Deborah and Zack, um, as a collective, because it's been Zack and his wife that have putting, been putting out these DC movies, and Joss Whedon working together earlier to kind of, and with Patty Jenkins and maybe a couple of other filmmakers and stuff, it's almost like they needed to make a Justice League of filmmakers, uh, Jeff Johns in that collective as well, before they started to really, you know, move in this direction. But all that being said, there is a lot of great work in this movie, and there's a lot of times where I busted out laughing, and I had a big smile on my face, and I felt like the, the tingles happening, like, oh my God, these guys are really going for it, and they're, like, there were some really cool, heroic, off-of-the-comic-page kind of moments in Justice League, and I appreciated them so much more. The, the Themyscira stuff was really cool, where we had uh, the battle with Steppenwolf and, and all of his uh, parademons uh, going up against the Amazonians. That was slick. Uh, I like the sequences where we get to see the um, the Atlanteans a little bit. You know, I mean, they're vignettes, and they're they're a, a little too slight for the scale of this movie. But the scale of this movie is also incredibly impressive. We have all of these disparate locations. We have all of these characters that sort of flutter in and flutter out. And some of them work to greater effect than others, for sure. It still bugs the hell out of me uh, that Amy Adams kind of, you know, talks about herself in the third person and says, I wasn't the glowing, uh, you know, reporter that uh, Lois Lane should be and you'd be disappointed in me. It's almost like they should have edited some of these uh, extraneous expository bits and just got to the... Like, if she had just said to Superman when Superman comes back to life... I'm spoiling stuff, so if you haven't seen this, you know what to do. But when Superman comes back to life and, and they're together and, and she says, look, um, you'd be disappointed in me. I wasn't strong. I, I wasn't that same plucky Lois Lane, you know, fearless reporter. It's like, just cut that stupid line out and you have a real heartfelt moment. You have a real, you know, connection, a heart-to-heart -heart connection. The thing that... There was a couple of things. There's the moment where um, Aquaman played pretty well by Jason Momoa. And the thing that we kind of, there's a couple of things. Like Gal Gadot has really sort of leveled up with Wonder Woman. But in the context of what she's been able to do in her career as an actor, to be that powerful against people like Ben Affleck, who has been acting for more than half of his life, who has had all kinds of opportunity and all kinds of, uh, you, you, you know, sort of expertise behind him. And then Gal Gadot comes in and she is like the heart of this movie. She's like the commanding presence, standing toe to toe with Ben Affleck. And even Henry Cavill's had lots and lots of work over his career. You know, it's amazing. And again, Wonder Woman is a, a major standout in here. But Momoa is in that same category. He's done some television, and he's but he's always just been this kind of cool-looking guy uh, that hasn't really had to act, you know, up above his sort of physical appearance. And in this, he's got some moments, and one of them is where he's sitting on Wonder Woman's lasso on the Batmobile, and he's just pouring his heart out, and it feels like, the, like it's registering. It's like, oh my God, he's really revealing his uh, neuroses and his concern, and he thinks they're all going to die, but he's still committed to it, and he believes in all these people, and I really like that. Some of Ezra Miller's stuff landed a little better the second viewing than it did in the first viewing, because it was really kind of, you could feel it like shoehorned in. Again, with editing, that stuff would have been a bit tighter and maybe time ran out or whatever. And I'm sure, man, like the, the, the cluster to get this done is apparent, you know? And it doesn't, you don't lose that when you see this again, but you also, you do see the work and there's some really good work. That's what I'm trying to get at. Like I really saw that they, they tried hard to build something with real value and real love. And there was a, there's a particular bit in the script, and I don't know who wrote this. I don't know if it was a Joss Whedon thing or Chris Terrio or Zack Snyder, but uh, Bruce Wayne at one point says, the world needs Superman, the team needs Clark. He's more human than I am. He lived in this world, he fell in love, had a job in spite of all that power, and he's just dumbfounded by it. And it's played pretty well by Affleck, who I, 
I have a kind of a love-hate relationship with. Like physically, he's good as Batman, but uh, he is he's like too big of a star. You know, you can see all of that experience and all that sort of self-awareness on his face. And I, um, but he also can act. Like he's got the chops. You know, he really can do it. You know, and so I, I did find myself way more engaged and way more entertained than I thought I was going to be. And, uh, you know, you couple that with production that is like really, really high, especially on a, a beautiful screen off of in 4K. And it, it was it was kind of overwhelming. I mean, it was it was overwhelming how much content is smashed together in this thing. Uh, but then when you have time to kind of just sit by yourself and uh, geek out to it. It was really cool. And there was like one of the end credit sequences, which anybody that's seen this thing, again, I'm spoiling stuff, but that race with Superman and the Flash is just so lovely. It's just so nice. That huge smile that Henry Cavill's got on his face. There's some genuine like, oh yeah, man, they really nailed it. Even Superman's return where he's punching the crap out of Steppenwolf, who still looks cheesy. They should have done a way better job with that villain for sure. Villains seem to be a very tough thing for all of these superhero movies to get right, but uh, it was fun to watch them beat the crap out of everything. You know, it was fun to see the different powers and the different effects and the different abilities and then, you know, the the just all-consuming sort of, you know, power that Superman has, the, you know, the overabundance of ability that Superman has, and he takes it to full effect, and he just, pow, punches Steppenwolf and avoids his uh, strikes at him. I thought that was really cool. Um, you know, and the, I actually dug the flash effects a little bit more this time. Maybe it's because I, I'm a little bit more removed. I'm not, like, watching the Flash TV show as uh, uh, fastidious, fastidiously as I have been in, pre in previous seasons. That's uh, no pun intended there. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, I, I came to this with f eyes that I'd seen it before and expecting it to, to be something I would just pick the hell apart. But instead, I, I really appreciated all of the work that went into it, and I was entertained. And then I watched some of the behind-the-scenes stuff, and I was racing to try to see as much of it as I could. I didn't see everything. Uh, I, I did notice in what I did see that there was a surprising lack of uh, deleted scenes. Like, there really could have – there's probably a ton that we're, we didn't get. Uh, but they took out a couple of um, – they, they put in a couple of deleted Superman scenes that I absolutely think should be in the film. And I thought about uh, running them on the screen there. But I, I think that you should check those out if you get this uh, Blu-ray or you get the home video thing. Uh, but I feel like there's lots and lots of territory that wasn't explored, which is – problematic with a movie that's released before its time. You know, this should have been given some time to gestate. Um, but, you know, I, I am a big fan of Ray Fisher as well. He, he hosts a couple of uh, the vignettes the uh, or the featurettes uh, on the behind-the-scenes stuff, and he's excellent, man. That guy's got a, one of the best voices happening right now. He's got a great tone and a great sound, and he, he actually did make me uh, believe in his cyborg as well. I, look, I'm as surprised as you. I thought I was going to hate it. Uh, but I, uh, I really, really dug it. And uh, uh, I got a comment from Fat Chimp saying hello. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry I haven't been following along as much. We are going to be doing some Let's Play and chat later on in the show. But, uh, you know, Justice League on 4K Blu-ray, um, and presumably it's going to look great on just regular Blu-ray as well. Uh, it was a great pickup. I'm really happy I have this. And uh, I, I think it's a great worthy uh, addition to my huge collection of superhero films. And that's, I think, another issue here that with, that this movie kind of faces is that we have so much choice in the genre and so many other things to point at. And, you know, the, the superhero team-up thing has been done better by Marvel, which I, I went on, like, for hours yesterday about. Uh, but still, lots of really cool stuff in here. And, uh, you know, Gal Gadot, I think, is the shining star in this movie. She's amazing. And uh, my, my respect and esteem for her continues to grow. Uh, I give the Blu-ray, because the movie still ain't perfect, but I give the Blu-ray an 8 out of 10. And uh, it's one of the movies that I am most happy to possess. And ain't that a surprise? Uh, but right now, let's take a look at a uh, buried treasure that is very appropriate for having Josh Sway on, on the show today. Here's a look back at Smash TV.
I'm jumping into the Wayback Machine for today's Buried Treasure. I am talking about one of my favorite Super Nintendo games, which was unfortunately not included on the uh, SNES Classic Edition that uh, Nintendo just put out there. This is called Super Smash TV. It's based on the old Midway arcade game that was crafted by Eugene Jarvis, one of my video game heroes, and Mark Turmel, who also did, uh, and he's also another one of my heroes, he did NBA Jam and NFL Blitz and all that stuff. Midway was just this powerhouse of development. Smash TV uh, basically lifted on the dual stick mechanics that Eugene Jarvis first introduced to us way back in uh, I think 1980 with Robotron 2084 which is one of my favorite games of all time but with Super Smash TV what they did is they gave you more of a kind of a narrative structure and uh, it really kind of borrowed from the idea of Running Man and these these cheese ball game shows and uh, you know sort of dipped into some our, our, our fascinations with reality TV and and even extreme sports all that stuff it was predating a little bit of that but I think, uh, you, you know, these game designers could see this escalation in, in sort of wacky television and they made a kind of a wacky television game show where you're running around blasting at all kinds of mutants and bad guys and uh, enemy types. Some of them are indestructible and they'll just keep charging at you and there's all kinds of awesome power-ups and you also collect tons of money and you're just trying to see how much money you can collect at the uh, at the end of every level and then you get into some of the weirdest boss fights you've ever seen you know this is uh really fun stuff it's really fun cooperatively as well and i know it's been ported to several systems it's also been included in uh, midway collections over the years i don't know if there's any way that you can go out and purchase a version of Super Smash TV or Smash TV in a in a real sense anywhere right now currently. I think it's been uh, ripped out of online stores, so you'd have to go out and dig up this cartridge, which is my first introduction to uh, the game on the Super Nintendo. I played it with my wife, incidentally. We loved playing this game together, so uh, yeah, it's very romantic, Super Smash TV. Uh, anyways, it's a fantastic game. It's one of the best dual stick shooters ever made, and if you're a fan of that kind of uh, gameplay, you're going to love this. Dig this up, find it somehow, because it's a classic buried treasure. There's a Midway classic that you all have to find a way to play. I know that they came out with an Xbox 360, uh, Xbox Live Arcade version of that. I don't know if it's still available. Uh, but yeah, I love that damn game. So cool. And speaking of games that I love, I've got uh, Burnout Paradise Remastered here on the PS4 for us to check out. Uh, this is just a regular PS4 and this is just a regular television and we're not streaming in 4K, so we're not going to see all of the, uh, the modern beauty that the game is capable of, but we can still kind of revisit and have some fun. Um, I'm going to set the timer for 15 minutes. Any questions or comments uh, that you might have, uh, we will uh, do our best to answer them. Blake's going to come up here and join me and uh, scroll through some of the, uh, the comments and stuff that we've had throughout the show. Just start the game so I can adjust the audio. Oh, okay. Here we go. We are racing. Boom. Um, so this is uh, uh, a game that completely addicts you in uh, all of the different ways that you can get lost uh, collecting stuff and secrets that you can discover and things that you can smash. You're getting music. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Right. I turned that off. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the menu system is a bit weird in this one. So let's see. Are you still hearing it? Uh, no, but that's because you paused it. Okay. Uh, let's so, see. I turned the music off. Uh, let's see. Music, but no, but no car. Okay. That's so weird. Uh, okay. Uh, it's pre release, so hopefully there isn't some kind of. Yeah, I turned music volume off, yeah. okay. and sound effects volume is on. That's tr crazy. Okay. So let's go back to the game. Okay. What do you hear now? It's like... I don't know. It's weird. It's like... Okay, maybe you yeah, know it's not. It is sound effects. Sound effects? Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> All right. So, uh, Burnout Paradise, for those that don't know, it's a huge open world uh, burnout experience. And, uh, uh, you've got all of these different events and things like that. This is the burning route. Um, let's see if I, I think I, what do I got to do? I have to, Hi everybody. I have to press R1 and L1 at the same time, I think. I haven't played any of this new version yet, so I'm not really familiar with all the controls. So just, just so you know, we're experiencing it together for the first time. I, I haven't played this game since it came out, which was 2008, right? Uh, it's been a while. Yeah, PS3, Xbox 360. Um, 
Thorazine 666 says a Switch reboot would be awesome. I fully agree. Yeah, totally. I, I don't play a game if it's not on the Switch anymore. It's a weird thing, right? Like the uh, the, the Switch is really like for Switch owners out there, it's uh, it's not like it's the, you, you're gonna get the best fidelity, but the idea of being able to bring it with you is so compelling. Yeah. I, like I've said this before, if I can't play it in bed, I don't want to play it. <laughs> I don't want to have to get up and go to my living room to play the PS4 game. I'm lazy like that. So I haven't been able to uh, keep up with any of the comments or or, uh, or questions or anything like that. If anybody's got anything, uh, feel free to fire them at us and we'll do our best to, to I, answer them. I have a good one from Warco A, Vic. Okay. Uh, he says, question, Vic, if you had to pick one, Justice League or Thor Ragnarok? Um, I mean, Thor Ragnarok's a, that's a, a pretty obvious movie. one. Yeah, 100%. But I think that I want to throw... I mean, I... Mean, I, I I didn't feel compelled to do this because I was genuinely entertained, but it's nice to be able to throw a bone to DC fans out there. They got a good movie. It's like, nice that they made a movie that wasn't terrible. It's a once. good movie. Like, it I honestly was a fun it's, movie. Yeah, and, it, I, and it holds together much better when you see it again because you're not like, what the hell is happening? I, I didn't hate through. it. I didn't think it was as bad. Like, it got like a 17 on Rotten Tomatoes or something. Yeah. Like, it's not that it, bad. There's a lot of hate out for it's it. It's better than people. It's still not a good movie. It's got problems, but it's not horrible and, and honestly like Warner Brothers brought it upon itself with the way that it's done a lot of this stuff and the one thing I didn't talk about in that review is that uh, Zack Snyder at least in the behind the scenes stuff that I saw he's in it a lot but they never talk to him they they, uh, <laughs> they interview his wife Deborah Snyder's in the, a lot of the interview clips that I saw and I haven't seen it all every single clip I saw uh, most of them but I didn't see every single one but I didn't see Zach get interviewed and I didn't see Joss Whedon get interviewed. I saw a lot of like associate producers and young producers and lots of comic people, which was excellent. They did a great job sort of uh, bringing all the uh, the DC collective on board. There's a huge chunk on the history of Justice League and media with Bruce Tim talking about all the animated stuff. It's a great disc, man. I can't I can't uh, tell you how happy I am that I enjoyed that. Like I thought I was going to hate it. I thought I was going to come away just just, you know, complaining about it, but I really liked it. So right now all I've been doing is smashing through fences. Do you think they're gonna make a uh, Zack Snyder cut and that's why there wasn't any deleted footage on the on this Blu-ray? I think it will really depend on how well this Blu-ray does. I think this is probably one of the most important home video releases in Warner Brothers history because I think it's really going to speak to how much they commit to the Cyborg movie and the other sort of things that have been percolating because there's been a lot of... Um, uh, questions about how far they're going to go forward with uh, the promises that they made on the release calendar. But if this movie does well, and other critics like like myself out there start talking about its its solid sort of they, singing some praises of it, uh, I think that will embolden Warner Brothers to uh, uh, to reinvest in some of this stuff. I mean, honestly, they didn't choose the wrong ingredients; they just baked the cake at the wrong time. You know, like they. They, just, they, they baked it wrong. They baked it wrong, yeah, yes. And they baked the wrong kind of cake for the wrong kind but of But imagine cake. how much better, um, you know, some, and it doesn't necessarily have to be Joss Whedon, but somebody with um, experience with a lot of this stuff, but imagine how much better Batman versus Superman would have been if Snyder had support like that in his camp. If he had some kind of partner that he could pair with that had done... Uh, you, you know, know a what? lot of genre stuff or superhero stuff like Joss you, you Whedon You know what his done. problem is? He always tries to write his movies, and I don't think he's a good writer. Like yeah. Batman vs. Superman, he tried, they came up with an original story, and he was one of the credited screenwriters, or story credit, I think. Yeah. He, he, helped, he shaped the story, and I don't think that's a good idea with him. It, he, he sh they should get a really good couple of writers to write a really good script, and then give it to Zack Snyder to direct, because Zack Snyder knows how to make a movie look good, yeah. but I don't think he's a very good writer. Uh, we got any questions there? Yeah, a couple of people are asking like whatever happened to game demos There's, eh, Still game demos. I just played a free demo of uh, Kirby on the switch. They call them betas now. Yeah But like Kirby had an honest-to-god demo. Yeah for free pre-release on the switch So and, uh, and that Octopath Traveler game. I played that a couple months ago. Yeah uh, and and there's I, demos. Yeah, I think there might demos. be more demos than than there used to be, but you yeah, know you have to but, kind of find them in early access and betas. They, and they used to have to do demos as a way to try to sell the game too, right? Yeah. Like the, you know, demos giving someone a demo disc in a magazine was like the, you don't need to do that today because they can watch a trailer to get the name, the word out about a game. De the demo discs used to be a way to make people aware of the game in the first place. Yeah. So they don't need to do that as much anymore. Um, on the PS4. I can't really, like, from my mind's eye when I'm playing this, 
I can't really tell what's different as I'm playing this right now. It what looks it looks really great. Yeah, it looks better than the PS3 version. But the PS3 and the 360 games looked pretty great, and I don't know if that's just my memory of how great the, that the game looked. Yeah, it probably is, because you always remember a game better than yeah. it actually was, right? But the one thing that I will say about that, and the buried treasures that we keep doing every day, is that, holy crap, is there a ton of great old games that are still very playable, like, when I when we did the split second buried treasure and and people like the the comments thing lit up with people sort of saying yeah, oh my god I love that game and that game had a really awesome making of documentary too <laughs> but you know what I'm saying is like there is no shortage of uh, of awesome titles that have been around for a while that are still 100% worth your time and they're also very very inexpensive um, so I, don't, I honestly I say this a lot but there has never been a better time to be a gamer. Uh, and there are just so many ways in and so many choices and and uh, don't ever discredit or discount the, You know the history the old stuff like burnout paradise the way that it was originally shipped Still very fun and less than the remastered version of the game um, And I can't tell I'm, I'm, I have I have just started it so I can't tell you what the improvements are or why it would be better, but uh uh, I'm excited that it's back because I really wanted to jumpstart it, but I don't think that this game, and most like a lot of reboots, I don't think that it diminishes the value of the original in its original conception, you know? I think the car models look a lot better than they did. Okay. I, I don't think you would have had it look that good on the PS3. I, I think one of the stores, if I'm not mistaken, like either PlayStation or Xbox, recently gave people Burnout Paradise as a free download. And, and, and another thing I remember reading, the crash physics are a bit better. Yeah. So try like destroying your car and see. Oh, I've had no issues doing that. <laughs> but, but I mean, oh. crash like head on into another car, it'll probably okay. look a lot better than okay. Yeah, you know, I see yellow fences and that's all I go for. I did, I did that so much. Oh, I have to hit my uh Yeah, like, my like boost. just destroy your car completely. Let's, see, let's go into this let's bus. See. Uh, I mean, it, they were great before. There's probably more textures. More polygons. Yeah, and crap that More comes bits out. come off. Mm -hmm. yes. they, they need to make a brand new Burnout game. Hell yeah, they do. Right? Yeah, I mean... If you if you have never played Burnout and never bought it, don't try to just find the old one and play it for free. It, it's it's great if you have it already and you, you are feeling like, okay, I'd rather spend my 40 bucks somewhere else. But if you've never played it before, hell yes, get this game. And hell yes, show EA that you support them making more Burnout because we yeah. really freaking need more Burnout. We need a new idea e in this universe. EA needs to know that these games are still popular and profitable. Yes. They don't, they don't just need to make loot boxes to make money. They can make uh, Burnout games. And, and honestly, what you're doing is you're showing EA and Criterion, who made this incredible franchise for us, uh, that, that you appreciate their work and you'd like them to do more stuff than they're currently being allowed to do because... As, as cool as the uh, the Star Wars flight stuff has been in Battlefront, I love that, by the way. It's my favorite part of both of the Battlefront games. Um, you know, they were freaking amazing at doing this kind of stuff. All right, I still haven't figured out how to do an event. I don't know if it's a uh, stunt run. Okay, got to press them both. Okay, here we go. It's hard, Blade Blur just said, it's hard to believe that this game is 10 years old. Yeah. And it is, like... We say this all the time, but like 2008 does not feel like it was 10 years ago. <laughs> it, it really doesn't, but it was. Like 2008 feels like it was yesterday. I, I can't believe that I, like, I watched Justice League on my TV this morning, <laughs> and it felt like I blinked <laughs> since November. Like, I feel like it was very yeah. fresh, yeah. the feeling of walking out of the theater in November, and it's already out at home. Like time is moving so freaking yeah. fast. I think part of it is we have a lot of things, a lot more things than any of us when we were younger. Uh, we have so much to engage us, and so many yeah. blinking and the, the, the lights. Constant and, just media blitz of news and, and entertainment and yes. everything. Just social media, just we're constantly plugged in. It makes everything blur together and speed viral. Quick. Yeah, it absolutely does. Uh, I have a nice comment here. Too sexy Travis Savage. Yeah. It's a nice name. Mm -hmm. Says, thank God EP is still around. It's helping me through a hard time. Uh, he doesn't say what the hard time is, but I'm glad that uh, we could help you through it. Too sexy Travis, hang in there, man. His problem is that he's too sexy. 
Everybody goes through some really hard stuff. And, and, I, I, and I have this too sexy problem all the time. <laughs> it is a burden. <laughs> you know what's not sexy? Talking about how sexy you are. Just pass making, that on. That's some, making a joke. Vic. That's some wisdom I've, I've, I've gained. Yeah, Stephen Hawking had a quote like that. Um, because I was reading through quotes he made this morning. Yeah. He died last night, obviously. And uh, he has a, a quote where he says, um, brag, people who brag about their IQ are the most boring people ever. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, I thought that was a nice quote. Yep. Never played Burnout Paradise. Yeah, Adrian Leon says he never played Burnout Paradise, so he's looking forward to this. Oh, yeah. So, yeah I, mean, I think this comes out on Friday. and uh, The other thing about these remasters is like... Boom, everything's full. Like you go through the uh, the gas stations. And, oh, I just had a refill on my boost. Okay. That's yeah, right. when you compare, like with these remasters, I think of it kind of like when an old movie gets a new 4K transfer. Sure. You know what I mean? Like, yes. There's no old movies we can't watch on every modern, on, on Blu-ray okay. or HD yep. on the TV, right? Good point, good point, yes. Like even movies from like the 30s and 40s, as long as they haven't been lost because yeah. of World War II or something, you can still get them on every modern format available this so. is like so fun I, I think the thing i think the same thing should it be with games like i should be able to play every game ever made on at least one or all of the current gen systems the oasis yeah 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 i i hope uh, you were talking about ready player one yesterday that it's gonna bomb you think that it's gonna uh, bomb it's tracking to i do think the, 35 i think the mil. movie's gonna not be good oh uh, wow. I, I haven't seen it yet so i don't know Oh, I hope I, ha I hope you're very. I'm wrong. just being. It's Buzz just me being good me, out my of, usual pessimistic uh, self. Buzz is pretty good out of Southwest, South by Southwest, where it premiered. Okay. There's some people that have seen it, and they didn't review it with a lot of joy. But uh, Buzz is pretty solid, and I've got a bunch of friends that have seen it, and uh, I trust them, and they're saying some good things. I don't want to know too much, um, but uh, have you read the book? Yeah, I read the book. I I I, I listened to the audio book when I had my uh, eye surgery. <laughs> And I couldn't, uh, I couldn't see when I got uh, the, the the lasers, the laser beams. Um, but I, you know, I, what I'm looking forward to, I want to see what uh, what he's come up with. I want, woo! I want to see what he's come up with visually, but I also want to see if it has any cultural impact at all. You know? Yeah. It it's hard to have a cultural impact when you're that derivative, though. True. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're. It's all about nostalgia. It's to, it's like fully mainlining nostalgia. This movie. But it worked for uh, Roger Rabbit, you know, and we haven't seen, we haven't yeah, seen but, a lot of stuff. But and Roger like, Rabbit had its own. Roger Rabbit himself is an iconic character. Jessica Rabbit, yeah. iconic character, right? Yeah. And part of that was. But it only became that through the yeah. act of honoring all of that, you know, all of those nostalgic. And part of it moments. was seeing Mickey Mouse and and uh, Bugs, uh, Bunny. Bug, Bugs Bunny on screen at the same time, which had never happened up to that point. Right. And Wreck-It Ralph was a financial success, although anybody that uh, knows a lot about video games, probably like like myself, I was I felt like they didn't go deep enough with the character roster, but it was cool uh, to dive into that space as well. And I feel like I mean they're making a sequel out of that one, so I I, I think I think they're they're you know Spielberg's. Spielberg is somebody that you don't bet against. You know he's had yeah. flops. I would say. I'd be I'd be a lot more optimistic about this movie if Spielberg had made it 20 or 30 years sure. ago. Sure. Spielberg today. 20 or 30 years ago, he was making three movies a year or something. Like well, he that. still is, Vic. His last movie just came out in December. <laughs> I know. His, la this, his last movie came out less than two months ago. <laughs> He's amazing, man. He's amazing, and I love the post. I he, thought it was fantastic. He, remember when he had two movies come out on the same day? He had. Um, War Horse and uh, Tintin. Oh, crazy! Came out the same, literally on the same Friday. That's nuts. In December, I remember. What like, were people thinking? How is this man still doing this? Yeah, like, he's seventy and he's cranking out these movies. So, yeah. although with Tintin, it's like you shoot it and then. Yeah, but like, still, it took so long in post-production. Those are both but, kid. Yeah. Oh, I guess War Horse wasn't a War kid's Horse movie. Was, yeah, yeah. Mm, it wasn't terrible. It wasn't like, you know, violent, but yeah. I never saw that movie actually. This is, I took my mom to see it. It was pretty good. I didn't hate it. It was based on a play, and it kind of felt like it was based on a play. You know, like every scene is just kind of very, like, one location. But Disparaging or not believing in Spielberg is uh, is is pure folly. Mm, but Vic, he's but, made a lot of bad movies lately. He, but he has made so much important movie, and so many important movies, so much important cinema, and so I'm much fun. I'm not saying fun. the movie's going to be bad. I'm just, yeah. I'm not convinced it's going to be good. Yeah. 
Well, that's probably a better place to sit and then be uh, positively like like my my Justice League screening today. I was expecting to hate it, and I ended up really digging it. Crazy. It's nice to like things. It's nice to turn out liking things, right? Yes. That must happen to you quite often. It does. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> so there's Burnout Paradise. I destroyed a lot of uh, yellow signs. Uh, I'm going to be playing this thing like crazy. Uh, but tonight I uh, return to the world of the Yakuza, and I'll have a review of Yakuza 6 soon. Uh, also, Johnny, uh, Millennium, and I are going to see Tomb Raider, and we'll have that review for you up on Film Fury as quickly as possible. Uh, and uh, we'll be back again tomorrow with a brand new episode of uh, EP Live. We're going to have uh, some of the people working on Nino Kuni 2 on the show, and I can't wait to talk about that game. I've had a little tiny bit of time with that, and uh, it's pretty. Uh, yeah, so we're going to have a great show tomorrow, so hopefully you tune in for that. Thank you so much for watching today. Thank you everyone that's tuned in live and supported us and, and offered up uh, comments and chats and questions and stuff like that. Love it. Thank you. And thank you to everybody watching the archive of this. We'll be back again tomorrow. And uh, make sure you check out some of the other content that we've been making. If you dig it, hit subscribe, that little bell. And if you're so inclined, that sponsorship button too. See you tomorrow.